you know, it's not just who pays the rent. It's also the fact that they get tax advantages too. So if the property ha is a Section 8 building and then you have tax exemptions or tax abatements, that's a, that's a big return on income for them. That's true. A lot of people really don't want to leave. <laughs> I, I've seen people <laughs> be in the units for over 20 years. But you know what's interesting? If they're a good tenant and they are in the unit for 20 years, that's fine. The rent might go up by the year, depending on if their income goes up by the year. But it will never go up above that 30% threshold for a Section 8 project-based voucher tenant. I want people to understand the difference, though. It's very critical to understand with Section 8, the biggest difference between Section 8 and market rate units is how we can increase the rents and the procedures in which we do it because remember how I said in section eight affordable housing right now HUD said that we can maximally charge 150% of a small, small area fair market rent. We can only do that if we engage what's called a rent comparability study or increase the rents year by year through an operating cost adjustment factor. And then you could also do a full scale renovation, but we can't charge that 150% rent of small area fair market rent immediately you can't just say oh next month we're going right. to charge you this in market rate units you might be able to do that you know you might be able to tell a tenant hey you know we need to renovate this unit or your rent's going up by two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars but you cannot do that in affordable housing you can't just push out price out a tenant in affordable housing you probably can most likely a lot of people have done that in market rate units so, you know, that's why I, I want our people to understand also the fact that we're talking about affordable housing. Again, like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that you make the units cheaper for the tenant, but uh, you get support of the government or the local authorities to make it cheaper or make quality housing available to people who are not able to afford that. And I think one of the ways of doing it, again, like we discussed, there are different ways of doing it, making part of the, the, the building you know, into affordable housing. And some places, and again, this is very specific to the area or the market that you're operating in, may actually give you tax benefits. So we talked about tax credits, and I just want to simplify that. Uh, what that kind of means is that people will actually, the operators, which in this case would be, say, for example, we have a building that we have, you know, we're operating in a, in a tax abatement area or a tax, you know, credit area, as we call it, um, we can actually apply for that tax credit. So what that means is that the taxes will not go up. They will be blocked at, you know, whatever the previous year's taxes were, and they will not go up because, you know, say we qualify for that. So that helps us as investors because that increases what we get into our pockets, and that helps the community overall because it creates better housing for people who are not able to afford that. Yes, I mean, tax exemptions and tax abatements exist for a reason. There's a difference. A tax abatement, like you said, they freeze the tax amount at a specific year that right. you apply for that tax abatement. But with a tax exemption, usually a tax exemption could be applied for Section 8 or tax credit housing, depending on how you've structured that general partnership, limited partnership, and the who has that loan on the property. So a tax exemption, meaning you don't pay the taxes, you save 200,000 in taxes per year, which is huge for your investors. But a tax abatement, it just keeps it at a low amount based on the year that it's captured. So yeah, and these are some of the strategies that we use, right? So when we are underwriting, when we talk about underwriting or kind of going through the numbers of the deals, these are some of the strategies that we will look at from a business model, from business perspective as to how we can make the numbers make sense for us uh, when we like something or not. Yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's very important to understand how taxes operate in the market that you're purchasing your multifamily deals or even your single family deals but also to see what incentive programs are available to you. And also to talk to brokers. You know, when we were out in Cincinnati, Columbus area, they were letting us know, how are you underwriting for your taxes? Are you underwriting them at 100%? Or are you underwriting them at 80%? You know, so they want to know, how are you underwriting your taxes? If you're actually applying the millage rate of the county, that's stated on the county assessor website. If you're factoring in a reassessment because sometimes uh, properties get reassessed upon a sale, a transaction. Right. And also, if you are going to make it an affordable housing uh, property, or if it's already a tax credit property, 
are you going to factor in a tax exemption maybe in the first year or second year? So it's very important to understand how taxes operate because it's a huge cost for your property. Right. Um, let's talk about, Andrea, about uh, you know the fact that you've been operating in this space. Um, what are the advantages to investors? I mean, we talked about the bottom line, but as an investor is getting into, into say, say somebody wants to dive into and focus on affordable housing, what are some of the advantages and what are some of the disadvantages that they face or hurdles that they would face right out the bat getting into this? You know, most people get shy away from affordable housing. And I want to tell people that I love affordable housing because I'm able to provide low income housing, affordable housing to tenants who really don't make a lot of money. So you can provide amazing uh, quality housing. You can renovate it, make it beautiful, be able to get that difference in rent from the government and make your tenants happy. So those are one of the benefits. Benefit number one, obviously, you can have so many strategies in which you can uh, increase the rents of this unit by renovating. So how you add value, value add to that unit. Number two is the tax advantages of Section 8 affordable housing. If you convert it to an affordable uh, tax rate of property, you can do what's called a bond play, where you make maybe 20% of the units into affordable housing. And then from there, you convert the building into what's called a limited partnership. And then you work with a nonprofit to hold that, you know, to hold the property under ownership, and then you become the subordinate lender. Uh, So that's another strategy. There's also, so we said the benefits is value add, how we add value. Number two, the taxes. Appreciation, if you're Investing in affordable housing, the appreciation will keep going up of any multifamily building because of the value that you're adding. Maybe you're adding additional income, charging for laundry, charging for other fees that you can improve the quality of life of others. But the difference, I will say, with market rate is that some people just choose market rate because it's a safer route and they don't know how Section 8 operates. I recommend people that want to invest in Section 8, they have a great property manager that can help them with the underwriting and also with the management because your property manager will definitely need to know how to work with Section 8 tenants to make sure that the building is safe. And um, some people just have this stigma that, oh, I don't want to invest in Section 8 because of blah, 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 blah. It doesn't feel safe to me. But there's ways on how you can create more safety for the tenants in those units, like security patrol, cameras, fob systems, the same way you would do it with a market. Better manager. lighting. Better lighting. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you said one time you were driving through one of the properties you have and then you're like, where is it? You know, you drove past it <laughs> two times. You're like, yeah. there's not enough lighting. It's the lighting too. Right. If there's fencing, you know, there's so many ways. Um, so I really like the benefits of Section 8 because you're able to, Work with all these strategies of value add, uh, you know, tax exemptions or abatements, appreciation. You're able to help the community by creating affordable housing, but you also have higher returns if you know how to operate it with your investors. So your your returns of um, internal rate of return or cash flow would be usually higher if you know how to asset manage Section 8. It's so important, the asset management part of it. Market rate, a lot of the times you're just going to uh, go off of the comps comparables in your area and you're, and the tenants are just, you might have a little bit more, um, you know, turnover, you know, unit turns because some people just can't afford living in a $3,000 one bedroom. They're probably going to go to the neighbor and say, hey, maybe it's $2,800 a month. So it's very competitive with market rate and the tenant will just go off their best interest to move to the next better opportunity. But Section 8 tenants will more than likely stay for a long time in the unit because they know they're not going to get charged more than 30% of their income. Right, and they kind of get used to it. And secondly, (laughs) of course, there's also a long line, right? At least I know in Columbus... Um, there is there is this pressure of uh, getting you know getting uh, there are more more tenants than there are units available. So I know that once they get in, it's kind of um, they kind of stay there for years on end. 
And so oh, that creates sure. a steady stream of income. And that's one of the, the one of the advantages is that if somebody is staying in a in a unit that decreases the turn. So that's the cost that, you know, say, for example, it's a, a tenant lease, you have to paint the unit, you have to do some some work in the unit. That goes down because your tenant is just staying there for longer, right? And the right. second thing is you're getting that assured rent every month till they're staying there instead of having to wait and kind of, you know, advertise the units again. So the advertising costs go down. So there are a lot of other advantages, um, even though they, they seem small, but when you add the dollars up, they really go, you know, they really make a big difference. And not only that, uh, not only does the, you know, change the cash flow or the net operating income that we, that we make, but when we do the calculations, uh, the, the upside that we talk about, right? So the valuation of the property because of the, uh, the, the changes, these small changes, the net operating income, I mean, the valuation goes up exponentially, it's not going up by a you know a few thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars there. It really jumps up because of these small changes that occur in the NOI. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you guys know how to underwrite with affordable housing or even just do multifamily underwriting, you understand that just a simple $50 increase per unit and you multiply that by the amount of units divided by the cap rate, you're able to see that increase in rent. You're able to, I mean, the increase in value. So you're able to see the increase in value right. just by increasing maybe $50, $100 here. It's incredible. So that's why every time I'm doing a rent comparability study analysis, so every five years, with, with a Section 8 HAP contract, lasts about 20 years. It's a housing assistance payment that lasts 20 years. Usually every five years, you can increase the rents to market rate. Uh, by making sure that you engage it with a third party assessor and then they tell you okay you could charge the three thousand dollars for your one bedroom so that's your way of ensuring okay this is what i can charge and then separate from that you're gonna have other charges like utility you can have um you know there's so many other additional income strategies that you can implement with multifamily investing and that's usually how we underwrite we see what is available nearby i highly recommend you guys call comps if you're ever doing a comp analysis comparables you're calling around to different units and you're asking specific targeted questions to see how you can increase the value of your own subject property all right guys if you haven't done already please go check out my free video series on how to do due diligence on operators and on deals before investing in them it's called real estate rx for passive investors and it's available at www.rerxcourse.com